So um, Tony and Travis are going to um, talk a bit about foundations. They have the, the lucky honor of being the last presentation of the conference, probably the, the worst job, but I'm sure they're going to provide us with, uh, with tons of good information. Um, certainly, uh, Tony comes uh, with a fair amount of experience in, in doing design. Coffin Engineers has, uh, has done all of, almost all of the, the Turbine Foundation designs uh, for Alaska, certainly that, that ADEC is doing. So if you want to know about Turbine Foundation designs and geotech for turbine systems, these are the two guys you really want to talk to. So it should be a very good presentation. Thank you. Uh, first, I just like to say it's just great to see all these people here at this conference. I had no idea it was going to be so big and uh, have so many people from around the world. It's great to have all these people supporting this effort. Um, so yeah, I work for Kaufman Engineers, um, civil structural engineer. We've worked on, uh, we've done about 20 of the uh, foundation designs for the 100 kilowatt north wind that AVEC has put in. Uh, we've also done designs for smaller wind turbines um, around the state. So we've done that civil structure. We've also been involved in mechanical and electrical work associated with tying those in, dump loads, and things like that. Uh, as far as foundations go, just one of the differences between Alaska and other places, so if you're working in California or wherever where you're on the road system, the key to your foundation is to make it stiff so that it doesn't vibrate at the same frequency as your tower and your turbine and then shake itself apart. And, and the other thing is to make it strong enough so it doesn't tip over. Um, in most places, you just basically keep pouring concrete in there until your pad's big enough that it won't tip over and it's heavy enough and it, won't, won't, it has a very um, low vibrational frequency so it's not an issue. In Alaska, there are a couple issues associated with it that you can't do it. One is it's very hard to get concrete in. It's very heavy. You need gravel, you need sand, you need good water, you need cement. and in a lot of places you have to ship that out there. So that can be a, a reason not to do that. A lot easier to ship in piles some, in some cases. Um, and the other issue is you can't set things on the ground when you have permafrost issues. If you put a big concrete pad right on the ground, that absorbs the sun, absorbs the heat, melts the permafrost underneath and, and sinks into the ground or tips or frost heaves or whatever. So that's not really an option. So this presentation is mainly on design, foundation designs associated with elevated uh, foundations that are supported on piles and there's actually air gaps underneath so that air can flow through underneath it and keep the ground cold in the winter so it doesn't thaw out. And also in some cases you even install thermosiphons which are freezing the ground, making it even colder around your piles so you don't have, have issues. Uh, that gives you kind of an idea of AVEC and the villages there. They've got uh, quite a few villages. They've, they've been, this has been talked about earlier um, all, over, all over that western side of the state. Uh, for Tuxuk, I'm going to kind of go through Tuxuk Bay, give you an idea of what Tuxuk Bay looks like. Uh, sitting there on the coast, no trees, no, no road access. There are some roads in town, but there's no road access to the site. So anything that was sent there had to get put on a barge. There's the turbines actually installed, uh, offset from the village a little bit for, for multiple safety noise reasons and, uh, and siting. You can also see on the far right uh, where the actual tank farm is that stores the diesel fuel for the diesel power plant. And these are pretty sizable. They're getting one delivery of diesel fuel a year, and that's it. So they're storing a year's worth of diesel fuel for their power plant. Uh, design criteria, class wind, very good. Um, class six wind regime. Uh, tower turbine weight was 42,000 pounds. The found, the, as associated with the uh, base frame under that, which might weigh anywhere from 40 to 70,000 pounds. And the rotor frequency is, is six, 60 RPMs. And the system frequency uh, is 1.05, so we ended up making the foundation stiff enough so that it was actually higher than the rotational frequency of the turbine. Um, the other thing that we have done on a lot of these systems is we actually do a finite element analysis of the soil, the pile, the base frame, the tower, and the turbine all as one model and determine the vibrational frequency of that whole system. So that's how we came up with our foundation design to make sure we knew it was stiff enough 
that it wouldn't match the frequency of the turbine and actually have a collapse. Kind of uh, some of the basic, uh, I'll let you talk about the geotech for that. Yeah, so um, tuk-tuk's uh, pretty typical and uh, you get some ice rich uh, permafrost. Is it this part of here? Yes, Talking. Talking. Um, covered with uh, tundra and organics. Uh, unusual here is the, the uh, siltstone we found maybe about 20, 18, 20 feet deep. Um, so <clears throat> the foundation was taking advantage of that siltstone because we didn't quite have enough uplift resistance within that, within that permafrost. So we had to um, get, it, get in down into the, the siltstone and, and install concrete sockets inside our, our uh, six piles that are arranged around the, this foundation. Um, and there were some special considerations of, of pouring that concrete into the frozen, frozen silt silt stone and uh, we didn't want it too hot to, to uh, melt all the silt stone yet um, we didn't want the permafrost to, to um, cause problems with the, with the curing of the concrete. Um, and then we also, uh, another thing that's important is, is uh, the anticipation of the thawed active layer, as you can imagine. Uh, the, the thawed active layer can get, get pretty loose and for lateral concerns you want to sort of limit that. Um, and in this case, we sort of designed for a future thawed active layer and, and sort of assume the piles fixed below that. Pass it off to Tony. Yeah, so we, we uh, did a static analysis of foundation, determined the number and depth of the piles, and then to taking that input it into our, our finite element analysis. And we used one program, which was a, a RISA model, and decided that that didn't have enough accuracy uh, we weren't getting good results. So we went to the, the S SAP software, which is a, a much more powerful uh, program. In some cases, you know, you, put, you input all the data and you hit run, and you might, I mean, when we first started this with the kind of slower computers, you might wait, you know, an hour or so before you got your results. So these were pretty, pretty detailed models. This gives you a, basically a picture, got that pointer there, a picture of the, the foundation each one of these circles here is actually a pile into the ground that Travis just talked about. Then we have this kind of star-shaped base frame and with, a, with an outer loop that connects the piles to make them stiff and an inner loop which actually holds the, the bottom circle that the, the tower actually sits on and bolts to. So you can see these are, these are pretty stout things. In this case, that once that steel frame was made, that was made in town, shipped out with all the tower, tower turbine parts, then we cast on site, cast that entire thing in concrete. And that was mainly to give it, uh, make it heavier and stiffer so we, we didn't have a, a vibrational issue. So that kind of shows a, a side view. So we had these steel piles that went down 20 feet we drilled out another 20 feet below that and poured concrete, added rebar. I got the pictures of that here. So this kind of gives you the, this is the tower base right there. So kind of give you an idea of what that looks like. So here's the, the nice conditions that they got to install these piles in. Uh, again, the tundra, you can't even drive out there in the summer at all. You just, I mean, you, literally your crane or even a, sometimes a four-wheeler will just get stuck in the, in the, out there because the, the ground is frozen about six feet down all year, year round and there's no drainage of water. So any water that starts melting, it basically just sits there. In this case, you can see we got all these different heights. We actually drove those piles, dr pre-drill a hole and then drive the pile in the hole until we couldn't drive it anymore. And literally the machine we ha had out there stopped. So once that was done, then you come back and cut those off to the, the proper elevation. So once the piles were in, we, we, so you got a crane out there to do some of the driving. Um, and then we got another piece of equipment out there to actually drill out inside that. So that drill bit you're looking at is probably 50 feet long. So it's just 20 feet in the pile and then 20 feet below the pile and then the parts are sticking out of the ground. So there's the rebar cage that goes down inside of that. There they are lowering it down in there. 
And again, that's probably a 50 foot long piece of, of rebar cage. So again, the cost of getting all that rebar out there is significant as well. So there they are after. So if we had six piles for each foundation for each turbine, and with four turbines out there, you got 24 of these you had to do. So very, very significant cost, as opposed to at other sites where you just dig out about a three or four foot hole, box it in and pour concrete in and you're done. Uh, the other thing you gotta do when you're doing a concrete foundation, it resists overturning by the weight of the concrete. It's very easy to calculate the weight of concrete. Um, these piles resist overturning from actually being pulled up out of the ground. It's very hard to calculate how the ground, the soil is gonna bond to that uh, pile, you know, 40 feet under the ground when you don't necessarily know the temperature. The, I mean, you have a pretty good idea because you usually, usually do um, boreholes beforehand to determine soil types, but you don't know. So we actually set up a system where we would actually do a, a pull test on that pile to make sure we were, we were in compliance with our design. Well, there's a picture of the base, for the steel base frame that was shipped out. And again, all these are where the turbine tower bolts down to. And those are uh, 18 inches deep. They're W18 beams. There it is with some of the bolts installed. Uh, something to notice is the drain. That would be a problem if you didn't put that in and you had, you know, we have, one of the other things that happens, Arctic conditions, if you have a door and a little crack and the wind is blowing, snow will go in. I've seen 30-foot um, modules, basically look about the size of a Connex, that a door was left, it cracked about a quarter of an inch, and when they came back three days after a storm, the entire module was solid snow, filled it up. So you're gonna get snow and water in these at some point, um, so we put a drain in there so it can actually drain out. There it is after pouring. And again, a significant effort to mix all this concrete, very small window of the proper temperatures for concrete curing. And there it is in its completed condition. Not a, not a small undertaking by any means. And Brent could probably attest, I think the foundation costs more than anything else on this installation, more than the tower and the turbine, I think. Probably. <laughs> Uh, and there's some of the, the response. So once the tower was up, we actually installed um, devices to measure the frequency. And you can see our calculated frequency with our model to the measured frequency was pretty close. Uh, we actually ended up revising that in the future, um, making a more detailed model so we could get even closer. So that's Hynek Tuksuk. And these are the modules that got shipped out there, the nacelles. Again, they get shipped out in the weather a lot of cleaning required when you barge something out there. There they are erecting the tower. In the, in the foreground, this is one that has a foundation that hasn't been poured. And that one is one of the completed ones back there in the Raging Tower. And again, that's, that's a significant crane for that village. I was probably might have been one of the largest cranes that had been out there. I don't know if they needed one quite that big for the tank, the tank farm work. Casigla, uh, kind of a similar situation. I'll go through this kind of quickly. So since we are the last ones, we'll try and speed through this. Uh, again, permafrost issues. Uh, I'll let you talk about some of these issues. Let me get the spot. Back up a bit here. Um, just want to first give a shout out to the design, design team and the owners and the contractors, uh, AVEC and Obviously, STG saw a lot of their photos. They've, they've built all these North End, one cut, one, North End 100s um, and have been successful on that. Uh, this is another uh, site, Kasigluk. And as you can tell from the photo, there, you know, this is uh, along the western, western coast in the YK Delta. Uh, and, and not much distinction between uh, land and water out there. And uh, pretty, pretty, there's permafrost for sure out there, but uh, closer to these larger w water bodies, it's discontinuous and degrading. Um, so that, I think Tony addressed this a little bit, but unique foundation conditions. So I'll give you uh, <coughs> just a brief summary of some of the unique conditions that, we, that we're designing for. Obviously, wind, the wind turbines uh, have dynamic wind loading and, and vibration loading. 
And the, the tower manufacturers require that the, there's a certain foundation stiffness just so that ensures the longevity of the turbines and, and uh, preventing the resonance. There's also uh, special soil considerations with uh, cyclic weakening and, and possible <coughs> degradation of strength um, from dynamic loading. And uh, as mentioned, concrete's uh, often used to provide mass and dampening, but out here it's not always available. Uh, so that leads us in the, into uh, pile designs and permafrost. Uh, as you can see in the upper right-hand corner, uh, this is, I don't know if you can make it out, this is temperature with uh, 32 here and then uh, minus, minus five on here, Celsius. Um, so, and then this is the add freeze bond of the, of the permafrost to the outside of the pile. Um, so a lot of cases in the YK <coughs> Delta were in sort of warm permafrost, so we're hovering right around 30, 30 degrees. So we're really on, the, on this low, really low end spectrum of, of this graph. And really, we want to be up in here where um, the freeze bond is, is pretty significant. Um, but the, the freeze strength is also a function of, of load duration. Um, and, and that's favorable in our case on these, on these wind turbines where you're getting, just getting short-term um, transient loadings and, and the permafrost can, can uh, the ad free strength on short-term loading is, is much higher than shown here. These are sort of a longer-term um, ad freeze. So that, that often leads us to um, integrating passive refrigeration um, so that our ad freezes aren't down here and we can chill the ground and sort of uh, get, up, get up in this, this graph. And a lot of times we count for maybe four or five degrees um, Fahrenheit chilling, uh, depending on the situation. Um, and just want to illustrate, so there's, there's a couple of different methods of integrating the thermal siphons or the passive refrigeration. Uh, this bottom picture here is um, a thermal pile with the condenser sort of gooseneck coming out and then the radiator shown right here. And, and that's integrated into the, the pile itself. It's a pressure vessel uh, rather than just like a, an open-ended pipe pile that's just steel. Uh, versus, uh, these are called thermal probes where this is just a, like a three and a half inch outside diameter steel pipe that goes in the ground. And those are usually installed uh, independent of the, of the foundation. So you can install piles in your, in your concrete and then drill these in afterward and, and uh, sort of uh, put these around the perimeter and keep everything frozen. Um, the other, other importance of keeping everything frozen is, is a lateral, lateral stiffness. So there's, there's often a, you got to think through the insta installation and how practical that might be. Driven piles aren't always practical in permafrost, so I think uh, STG's had a pretty good success with that. So sometimes you might have to do thermal modification or pre-drilling or um, with the with the uh, thermal piles there, sometimes you have a helix, so you, you'll, you'll drill out a bigger hole and set this thing in and, and slurry it all back. Um, and ba battering of the, of the uh, foundations, we haven't quite integrated a lot because it, it adds a lot of difficulty um, and complexity in the installation, C certainly in permafrost, but it, it can add quite a bit of lateral stiffness. Um, so in Kasiglik, uh, the design was six, six piles that were uh, screwed into the ground, passive refrigeration. I'll go through these quick because I think we're running out of time. There's a typical section of the, the tower. You got your thermal siphons here and you got the cross section of your piles and you got an insulated fill pad. Um, here's a plan, plan view we've seen similar to that. Hook to hook, here's your wagon wheel, here's your six pile. Now here's uh, STG screwing in the uh, helical piles. I should say that um, these helical piles came from Almeda, a company in, in Alberta, and they helped with design and sort of HDL and um, proprietary system, uh, and, and STG torqued them in the ground. Uh, here's a finished product on Kasigla, and I'll let Tony talk about the tower. Uh, 
really not too much difference here from Tuxuk. We'll uh, move on to one of the different configurations. So the Hooper Bay was where we kind of went to a, a more detailed model, and this kind of gives you an idea of the finite element analysis. Um, so this is the pile in the model. There's the base frame. Here's the tower. And you can just see how there's a lot less detail in our model here as opposed to this one. Um, so really did a lot more detailed analysis on that system. That, that allowed us to, uh, you know, revise the, the design so we'd get closer to not, over, not designing it any more stiff than we needed to, but also being able to predict what our frequencies would be of those foundations. Uh, this one, unlike the previous one with the concrete encasement, we actually made a larger steel base frame that was stiffer all by itself so they wouldn't have to pour the concrete in the field. And, and I think that worked quite well in some cases. They're, they're actually now AVEC is moving to a precast concrete uh, base frame for that. Now Gamble, very similar um, as far as where it is in Alaska, but it's near the sea and there's a lot of gravel there. In this case, we were ab actually able not, not required to put in the, the pile foundation. Um, you can see here it's basically sitting right on the Bering Sea. This is kind of a big gravel beach area. And again, you'd see there's lots of gravel. Uh, there is some permafrost in some areas. And for this one, we were able to go with kind of a standard foundation design you'd see in other parts of the world basically have a, a, a concrete pad with a concrete pier on top of that that the tower just sits on. So because we had gravel on site that we could use for um, making concrete and the permafrost was either not going to affect us because of the soil conditions, um, we were able to go with this type of, type of foundation. And there it is in, in forming that up and you can really see how, how much gravel there is out there compared to you know, a, a tundra situation. Um, so, Kakanak, how, how much time do we have? <laughs> how much time do you guys have? That's the real question. <laughs> uh, if you could say something like five or something. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, Kakanak, um, I'll talk about this briefly. Instead of the Northman 100, they actually use the Vestas, and this has been talked about already. Um, lower wind speed. Lower RPM um, made it a lot easier to come up with what the uh, um, a, a nice foundation. And again, we had uh, gravel that was accessible out there, and so we ended up going with a concrete foundation. Also, one of the things to note: the these are lattice towers. Uh, tube tower has a lot of advantages, but it also has a very small footprint. So the overturning forces are very large. So your your foundation has to deal with that. When you have a lattice tower, you usually spread the legs out farther, so the overturning forces are reduced quite a bit, so your foundation doesn't need to be as, have as, has the huge loads on, so it, it was easier, again, to go with a, a concrete foundation. You wanna, I think you got some vehicles to cover that here. Oh, here's your aerial photo of the Kakanak area. Uh, this is being on Lake Iliamna. Uh, some of you might be familiar. Uh, pretty pretty large lake in between sort of mountains, so you get a lot of a lot of wind rip, ripping through those that mountain pass. Oh, one thing to add, I was talking to uh, uh, John Lyons, who did the installation. I guess uh, last week they had sustained winds at the turbine to hub height of 123 miles an hour. Just not something anyone was anticipating. And as some of you might see that are going on, on the field trip tomorrow, uh, there's the installed turbine. Uh, so geotechnical conditions, here's that, that gravel spit again, all that's uh, Lake Iliama there. Um, so pretty much rounded, rounded gravels everywhere. There was a little jelly bean of uh, shallow bedrock, um, though it, it didn't really coincide. It was, it was pretty, pretty limited in space. And it didn't really coincide with the, with the uh, wind direction. Wind is, is somewhat in this direction. So there wasn't really enough area to, to plop two turbines on there. Um, as you'll see in the next slide, um, we were able to, I'll show you the turbine location. Oops. Let's 
two turbine locations are right there and right there. So we're sort of hugging this, this shallow bedrock, but we had to space the turbines out far enough um, to not totally be on top of that bedrock. Uh, so the first turbine location, we sort of found, a, it, we're in the beach gravels, but we found um, sort of a bedrock shelf that's underneath. So that was a pretty good, stable foundation bearing material. Uh, and then the other site uh, is, is bearing on glacial drift, as, as most of you know, is pretty stiff and hard. Uh, and, and like Tony said, yeah, there's some clean sand and gravel that Marsh Creek took advantage of and, and, and batched some concrete there. And um, basically the concrete was raised so we wouldn't, we're excavating into the, into the groundwater of Lake Yomiamna. And uh, pretty good bearing materials that, that, weren't, that was not susceptible to cyclic weakening or dampening, I mean uh, dynamic strength loss. So here's a, a picture of sort of the schematic of the, of the foundation. Again, it's a, it's a four-legged tower, lattice tower. So you got these uh, sort of concrete pedestals at, e at each of the towers. And then uh, there's concrete footer type base buried in. And um, pretty good system of resisting overturning uplift and, and still provide stiffness. Um, so again, uh, now getting into the realm of sort of smaller type turbine uh, foundations. And certainly there's been a lot of pictures of these um, these guide towers, and certainly there's there's a lot of um, value in, in, in that, in the, in the ease of those installations. Uh, if you can't afford to have guys spreading out, uh, there's some pretty basic ones. It's just a, a concrete pier. Uh, you can either drill it or, or excavate it in place, or just a basic concrete mat. And summary, I, I, we've gone through most of that, so we could just uh, go into questions. Uh, in regards to the Hooper Bay Foundations, I think it was Hooper Bay, uh, you showed a, a foundation, a steel foundation with uh, maybe 24 or 30 inch depth as opposed to uh, 12 or 18. Did I understand correctly that one did not need to be encased in concrete? Correct. We, we made the steel stiffer and larger members so we didn't have to do the, the concrete work. Uh, let me add a comment to that. At uh, Tuxuk Bay, we, the tower was a used tower that came from California. The pilings were leftover pilings from a job in Nome. And so there was an assemblage of a, a bit of surplus material. And in the course of that project, when, the, when that material was on the barge, uh, we got a call from in, an engineer at Northern Power saying, I think we have a problem here frequency because the piles appear to be, they're going to act as an extension of the tower. So then we had to figure out how to dampen that. At the time, remember the materials are on the barge. Um, we tried to find, we tr originally tried to find a uh, thicker web uh, piece of steel to build the foundation from. We could not get the steel in time on a barge to get it to Tuxuk Bay. So the 18 inch web was what was used we had to figure out how to dampen that. Um, and so STG and others did a tremendous job of uh, trying to pull that together. We, we basically had to uh, design it on the fly. It reminded me of a scene, I don't know if you've seen the movie Apollo 13. <laughs> you know, here's what you got to work with. And it was literally like that uh, for about two weeks in our office. Every morning we would meet and go over calculations with Kaufman, uh, do what if, uh, questions sent out to their office in California. The next morning we would have uh, answers back and <coughs> we'd work the next iteration of the problem. That's why we don't use concrete anymore if we can avoid it with those steel frames. We got Carl here first and then Kevin. I, I guess you know, um, Brett may have answered the question ahead of the reference to the Dan Wind and the, Nor and the Nortang Towers, which are old Danish designs, but I guess those are used towers. Uh, those thermal siphons, are they uh, locally made or are they, they, they look like they're just a pipe sealed at both ends full of refrigerant, or, or are they actually engineered components that are bought from the cell? Yeah, it's a, it's a company here locally in Anchorage <coughs> called Arctic Foundations, and, and um, they fabricate them here in, in Anchorage. 
and he, they're completely designed. So, so yeah, essentially they're a pressure, pressure vessel, sealed top, bottom, and then there's a refrigerant in there that, that cycles in there. Uh, the refrigerant um, evaporates from the heat in the ground and then goes out the top into the condensers, the radiators that are above grade, and that, the, the coolness of that condensers again completes that cycle. So, so yes, they're, they're highly tested and highly engineered um, and we, they have uh, pretty much a, a standard radiator design now that is pretty much a, a number of, so, so each, each thermal siphon isn't really custom made for each site for how much heat you need to remove. Uh, we typically use their, their standard um, radiator that pulls out a certain amount of heat and then it's just a matter of the number of radiators and how, how we space them. So we usually use the standard ones that they fabricate, yes. And, and this, um, the engineering that's required for doing these add three piles, these Arctic foundations, is this largely accumulated in the north? Or is this, I don't think I've seen any, any books in this. Is there Arctic design foundation <laughs> technology, uh, books around, or is this something that you gotta, you gotta be here to know how to do it? Yeah, I mean, I've got a number of them on my shelf, so it, it is somewhat uh, specialized, um, cold region sort of engineering. Yeah, there is a lot of literature, literature on, especially up here, though, yes. Bennett? So I, I got two questions. Uh, one is, what special measures did you use to, when you poured the concrete the permafrost, to make sure it cured right? What were things you were looking for during the curing process? And two, after this experience, sort of, what are you looking at to lower the cost of Uh, and, and I can't speak in great detail about the concrete. Um, that was somebody else, either Kaufman or Golder, that, that looked at that. Um, but it, it, I mean, essentially, there, there was e enough mass of the concrete that we were convinced that it would generate enough heat. There's a, a special cold climate grout. It's called fondue grout that um, can cure in cold temperatures and uh, doesn't generate a lot of um, excess heat and, and really specialized to, to cold climate pores. And to address your, your, your second question, um, I think as Clinton alluded to yesterday, um, as much as they can prefabricate things, um, either in Seattle or Anchorage, that helps um, save certainly inst installation time in the field. So yeah, some precast caps that they're looking at and these uh, all these steel caps are, are pre-made so um, I think that's the direction they're going. Next question here. After you uh, put in your pile, how long did you wait and uh, did you test, how long did you, how long did you wait before you tested and did you test every single pile that you put in for the pull test? Usually the, the full on pull test is, is one per, per tower. And um, that sort of depends whether you have passive refrigeration integrated in there. And so as, as you can imagine um, with a, like a, a thermal pile where you, you dump in all that slurry, you know, essentially sand and water dumping in, in this hole, you need to verify that all that stuff has frozen back before you, before you put the cap on, before you start loading those piles. So, um, those are those are tightly monitored to um, make sure that all that all that slurry has frozen back before you load them. And usually, uh, it's it's guys in the in the field that are chomping at the bit to to put this cap on, and, and we've got to say, hold on, hold on, we got to make sure that all these temperatures are, are cold enough and everything's frozen back to have the capacity to load these things. Um, but with with the um, with the installations like in Tuxuk. Uh, just long enough for the concrete to cure. So I think the pull tests were, um, uh, you know, a matter of weeks uh, within the, the concrete pour, yeah. I can add. Um, something to add to that. For most of the North Slope facilities we do that are using piles, you know, in, in permafrost, I would say, you know, anything that's a significant load, they're actually installing them uh, in the winter and not loading them at all until a year later. So they wait an entire year before they load up those piles. Uh, I got a couple questions here. 
Uh, the first one is on the thermal siphon issue. Um, typically, how many would you use? Say you're doing, uh, how many thermal siphons would you use and uh, what's the added cost to the foundation when you use a thermal siphon? And the, the number of thermosiphons depends on um, just the geometry of the foundation. Uh, if you think of, they, they pull out heat sort of radially, so, um, and their, their zone of influence is, is only so far, you know, beyond these thermosiphons. And usually that spread is, is maybe, uh, the most that they can pull out is maybe five, six feet, or depending on the soils, obviously. So um, you, have to, you have to know that sort of spacing them, but, on, on most of these, it's a thermal probe at, at each of the piles. Uh, in Macoriac, uh we put in four, four thermal probes for the six piles. So sort of met those in between the, the foundations, so. And then the added cost is 20000 per thermal probe? Um, they're probably by the time you install them. Probably, that's probably about right, yeah. I think that they're, uh, each of those is certainly um, in the four to $5,000 range uh, here in Anchorage, and then to get them out and install them. Installation. And then um, on your a typical foundation, and say some marginally frozen permafrost, what's the payback on the actual wind turbine installed with the foundation? Because uh, we spoke earlier, and you said the foundation can be up to half the total cost of installation yeah I mean the I think the to summarize this entire um, presentation in, in just one sentence is that the foundation needs to be really stiff so that the tower and turbine don't shake themselves and for just longevity's sake it, it pays to um, refreeze that and make sure that the material is ref, ref, uh, remains frozen over the life of the turbine and um, I just don't I, don't, I don't see in some of these areas, I don't, I wouldn't recommend installing piles, w you know, w without passive refrigeration, just knowing that if the, the thawed active layer does progress, then you, so, you sort of get really a sloppy situation in, in that upper zone. And, and then on that figure, you have those curves with that data. Um, where's that data from? And do you know how old that data is? Yeah, that's, um, that's 1978 data f from studies that were done up on the slope, and it's referenced in, in a number of um, textbooks, and I can get that to you more specifically. It, it is in there, but it, it's, uh, I mean, pretty much any, any permafrost pile design textbook will reference a similar plot to that. Uh, I think those studies were uh, by Weaver. I can give you more specifics on that. Just, uh, and then yeah. is there any uh, planned research to maybe update some of those numbers, maybe try and get a little bit better idea? I don't know who, cur who is currently working on it. Um, yeah, so I don't have uh, many connections with the university who's, who's doing that right now. It's, it, uh, I find that there's quite a bit of data on that ad freeze bond. And then, uh, have you guys considered using helicoil screws for uh, guy wire securing? I, I mean, I saw your helicoil pile that you had, but a helicoil screws screws a little bit different. No, I think that that has a lot of, a lot of merit in in that you're jumping into the realm of sort of these lighter gauge towers and turbines that are that are guide, and, and I think that yeah, something that you can you can screw into the ground um, is is fantastic and uplift. You do, if, if they're sort of shallow, you know, you, Tom, typically you're, you're, those are sort of screwed in pretty shallow and they work great. There is some strain in the long term as, as there's uh, frost, freezing and thawing of that active layer if those are installed uh, pretty shallow. So there can be some long term strain, so you just might have to tighten them up. But no, no it's a great idea to, to anchor those things with some sort of screw, yeah. Uh, something to add about the, the guy wire stuff. Um, one is some of the, the lower, the shallower soil anchors, the manufacturer actually won't warranty their, you know, if they give you data for their pullout strength, if you're working in an active layer, they say that doesn't count. So if you're supposed to go eight feet deep or 10 feet deep on your soil anchor and you're going in an angle, 
if that top six feet is you know peat and permafrost stuff that doesn't count towards your embedment so you may end up having to put a soil anchor that's only supposed to go eight feet you know 15 or 16 feet in the ground so some of your cost is lost the other issue with um, a lot of the sites in Alaska is uh, bird migrations, things like that, and guy wires, actually, they're <coughs> totally trying to avoid them completely. Um, as John Lyons mentioned for Cold Bay and King Salmon, that was a requirement for, from the uh, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, no guys at all, period. So you kind of kind of stay away from those. Plus, the other thing that happens if you're working out on the tundra and you've got to access a larger footprint, there's a lot more costs associated with that. So sometimes the savings in the foundation size in the middle under the tower is offset by your requirement now you got to go all the way out and around it and, and access and in the summer sometimes you can't even access those um, depending on where you are you may need a special permit even to walk out on the tundra great thank you thank you gentlemen